Well, hello everyone, Mark DeJesus here, bringing you insights and encouragement and equipping for you to live in the mental, emotional, and relationship health that's available for your life and your journey. Today's broadcast is going to be on a subject that was brought to my attention in a question. And as I read the question, I said, you know, I think it's time for me to talk a little bit about this more and bring some some context and some feedback that I think could be helpful because when I look at subjects in the body of Christ, I look at things that believers are going through, a, the heart that I feel very strongly called to bring is the heart of being rooted and grounded in producing, manifesting fruit in our lives, showing the fruit of the Spirit, showing where we manifest healthy relationship patterns in our life, healthy thinking patterns. I'm very passionate about helping people in their mental health and how they process emotions, the life of their home, how they do relationships. We focus on a lot of things, but we don't always center in on some of the most important things, that being being rooted and grounded in love. And I... Paul said that in Ephesians, he said, you know, that you be rooted and established, rooted and grounded in love. And that is a very deep precept that I want to bring to people's lives is encourage us. What does it mean to be rooted and grounded in love? Today, I want to talk about what does it look like to experience mental health, fruitfulness, to grow in mental health in the perspective of prophetic ministry. And a question was brought to my attention, and I'd like to talk about prophetic words, prophetic ministry in the context of what it can look like to address some areas that don't produce mental health and emotional health and relationship health, become aware of it, and what are some ways we can be more grounded in it. You may approach this subject, and you may see no use for prophetic ministry. You want nothing to do with it. Uh, that's, that's not my intent here today to try to argue that. Um, <laughs> you know, if that's where you're at, that's where you're at. But the Bible does talk about don't despise prophecies. There's so much about prophecy in the scripture. Uh, sometimes we become obsessed with false prophets that we never think about, well, what is a prophet? And I, I, I could go in so many directions today, but I think what I'm going to do is, is, is give some things that I think are important for our journey to take in mind. I think we can all benefit from this and experience some health. And so this is a great question that was sent in and I'll navigate that and kind of share some points. I'm, I'm going to think I'm going to bring up a few scriptures too, and just navigate some of my own experience and share some of the things that I've, uh, I've definitely had a involvement in, in being connected to prophetic ministry. I've seen it in action. I've seen behind the scenes in front scenes, <laughs> whatever front stage, backstage. And I've also navigated the pastoral world of it. I've also navigated the one-on-one -on -one session of how people are impacted in a counseling session to see how people are impacted by prophetic ministry and prophetic words. And there's there's some genuine uh, concerns. But I, I, I want to navigate this in, in, through the question, give you some thoughts. So let me get started with that. It says, hi, Mark, thank you so much for your ministry, which has been so incredibly helpful in so many ways. So I appreciate for you and your wife and all that you pour out. I wonder if I could submit a question. Would you consider addressing prophetic words and God's will for people in charismatic churches who have OCD symptoms? And so I'm going to, I think what I'm going to share today could benefit people with OCD, people with struggle with depression, anxiety, or even just in general, you, you, you struggle with certain, uh, certain aspects of God's will and those kind of subjects that spin you out. I, I would say on the list of subjects that spin Christians out, it can be the subject of God's will. And so you've taken the term prophecy and you've you kind of merged it with God's will here. Um, and so I'd like to kind of talk about those terms because when we talk about God's will, Christians can be obsessed with making sure they're in God's will. It's a pressure thing. And it can even get down if you're obsessive compulsive that if you turn left, oh, you missed it, you should have turned right. And I started to see my perspective of God's will become an obsessive thing where it got narrowed down to, uh, I don't know why this moment is, is a memory that's very highlighted, but it is because it just showed how, how pressurized the obsession with God's will can become. I bought, I was single and I, I bought a DVD player and I, I bought it and I had this thought, you shouldn't have bought that. It's against God's will. 
I'd already brought it home and I realized the ridiculousness of this thought, but yet it felt so strong and I felt like, well, maybe God doesn't want me to have this DVD player. So I like, I was walking through my mind, like going back to the store and then I, you know, I'm like, do, do I, do I got to tell them that, that I was just so not now I'm thinking about, should I confess this to the store too? Whoo, wow. This can get, it can get really out of hand when we pressurize God's will. And so one of the things that I want to encourage is that we, we tend to want direction from God. And what we need to do is know how to cultivate relationship with God because we treat God like a, like a, like a slot machine kind of answer kind of person. Give me answer. Hey God, what should I do? And nothing wrong with saying, God, what should I do? Help me, you know, show me. But we emphasize that without learning how to connect to his nature. And I think God's work with us is get to know me, get to know my heart. Out of that, you become renewed. And out of the renewal of that, you begin to see where God is working and you know how to walk in his steps and you see his hand working on your life. It doesn't mean you know perfectly where you're going, where you're headed. I think that uh, even young people today can be uh, obsessed with, I got to make sure I'm in God's will. What's my plan? What's my calling? And it's more about practicing relationship with God. And and out of that flow, that's where renewal happens to our thinking, and it helps us to see opportunities and things of what God is doing in our life. And I'll, I'll even put this up as a as a scripture here. Uh, Romans 12, and, and I emphasize this, this is a really important passage of scripture that I think helps in, in mental health and, and, and even putting in perspective, you know, God's will. Cause we think about, you know, God's will, I got to know God's will, I got to will. And I'll tie in now, like what, what is, you know, prophetic ministry look like within that context. So I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now I want to say something about reading the Bible for mental health. It is a common pattern that Christians, when they read the Bible, this is what they do. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, blah, 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 living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. Oh, boy. Yeah, I got it. It's like, wait a second. We don't know how to take words in and let them have an effect. I beseech you. This word speaks of to invite, to invoke, to, uh, um, in, in, in some of these words I, I don't use, but <laughs> imploration, <laughs> hortation, or consolation to call for. Be of good comfort, to entreat, right? So there's a word comfort nestled in the meaning of this word. I'm calling you to bring an exhortation to you, to bring comfort to you. That's important. So when you read the Bible, it's important that you stop on words and, and, and marinate. Because most people, with like especially religious OCD, you fly through scriptures and you just you just look at something that looks disturbing and you lose context. He says, "I so he's calling you to something he's saying that's going to bring about an exhort exhortation, a comfort to you. So it's going to help you. So you should walk away from this word going, hmm, all right. I feel more rooted in God's love. I feel strengthened by the mercies of God. Ooh, this is." God's mercy towards me. That God, in my struggling, in my suffering, in my battles, God sees me with love. Wow. Okay, we haven't even gotten to what he's saying yet, but we set the context. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. So it's like out of response to this comforting picture of God's love to me, when you connect to God's love, it's like, man, I, I, I'm all in. I'm all in. This a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God is your reasonable service. It's a, it is a, when you connect to that mercy, that's your response a lot of times. It's just this like, wow, I just, I, I, this love is so amazing. So here's what I want to get to. Do not be conformed to this world. So there is a, there is an, a, a working here of, um, the world's system. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to get into the, the meaning of that word. The, the world system, don't be conformed to it because there's a, there's a way that it operates and wants to have, a, have an influence on your life. You're called out. You're different. You're different. I mean, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is a continual process that is going on in our lives. 
And when I teach people about the renewing of the mind, what we are learning to do is we are learning to think like our father thinks. We are learning. Uh, you ever, you ever, you ever see a kid, and I'm sure they're gonna do that with my kids someday, where you see them act in a certain way, and you go, "Oh, uh, look, uh, yeah, I, I see Mark there. Did you see that? You see that? You see the father's traits in the children, or the mother's traits in the children." We are learning to renew our mind so that we can begin to think and begin to process our journey. Now, out of that, he says that you may prove what is the good and acceptable will and perfect will of God, that there is a work of God in your life. So my job every day is not to obsess, am I in your will? 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 My responsibility each day is to, in relationship with God, I'm letting renewal happen. Renewal of the mind doesn't happen under duress, under pressure, under force. It happens relationally. Things begin to open up and you begin to, the, like Paul put it this way. He said, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. It's just this, this sense of awakening. Ah, I it's like when I realize I need a revelation of the Father's love. I, I, I don't know what it's like to connect to your love. Here I am doing stuff for you all the time, and I don't even know what it's like to just relate to you in love. I need a, I need a massive reversal. So the will of God flows out of mind renewal. Do you see it? And so for many of us, we flip it. We're like, I got to get God's will. I got to know God's will, and then I'll think better. And here it's like, no, first of all, let's just, let's just bathe ourselves in connection to God's mercy, his love for us. Because out of that, the, you, when, I, when I got connected to God's love, I changed the whole direct tra tra trajectory of my ministry work. I, I left everything. It started from scratch. And you say, well, Mark, are you really brave? Are you really courageous? It's just really a response to the goodness of his love for me that I was awakened to. And it shifted everything. And I saw a whole new journey open up, a whole new chapter open up out of response to that. That was like, God, I just want to just go for it, right? But see, we, we often, our mental health journey, we look at passages of scripture like this and we get bound down by it. And what I'm going to get to even later as I talk about you know, prophetic ministry is... Um, is helping us to understand where we get really off track by confusion. And God is God is not the author of confusion. So I first of all want to establish that premise. Now, when we look at the the workings of a prophet, and, and uh, today I'm not trying to cover everything that uh, the Bible says about a prophet. I'm not sitting here trying to do a long teaching on everything about a prophet. But I, I do think there's some things that are are helpful to understand. In, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, Paul says, says this statement, he, and, I, and I'll refer back to this because I'd like to, to, to uh, get some healthy perspectives. Let's look down here. Where is it? Uh, first, uh, okay, right here. He who prophesies. This is a, I believe this is a very important understanding for, uh, for the context of prophetic ministry. He who prophesies speaks three things, edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. There is a work of the prophets where they are to be helpful, to realign people back to what is true, to ground them in that so that they can be strengthened, they can be built up. And so this word edification, it, it speaks of like, like an edifice or like an architectural structure. It's, it's a building up, the act of building up. Now, part of building up may be if I showed a contractor a crack in a wall that I have or somewhere, he may want to go, what's going on at the foundation, right? And so for many in ministry work, we got to do some rebuilding of people's foundation because we're building up this edifice, Right. This, this, this architectural structure where we're building up believers, but we're also building up the whole body. So we're joining together, working together, each one contributing who they are in God to each other because no one has the monopoly on God. No one has everything. 
We all need each other, right? And so the, the work of prophecy, what it should do is, hey, I'm adding to building the structure. It's like <clears throat> strengthening this, adding faith, adding hope, adding love. My perspective gets realigned again. Uh, exhortation here. We look at the word exhortation. There's a there's a, a neat word consolation that's that's also brought here. And here again, we see what Paul was saying. Back in Romans, there's a calling near, like when he said, "I beseech you." You know, there's this this bringing in exhortation, admonition, encouragement, that which affords comfort and refreshment. Okay, so so the the, the work of the prophets is to remind people. It, they're, they're big time reminders. They're also to speak in a way to bring things into context. They're very, they're when, a, when, you know, you can have someone prophesy. Does that mean they're, they're a prophet? Man, not necessarily. Um, I, I get, I get off tangent. <laughs> Let me stay focused here. A prophet's work is he's going to take the word of God and help bring real context, speaking to where we are. Now, sometimes people say, well, we, we need prophets that um, in the Old Testament, you know, they have an Old Testament prophet perspective, which is like, if that prophet's wrong, uh, we need to stone them or never listen to them again. And uh, many people want the Old Testament kind of yelling, screaming, or maybe like a, a, a harshness that's there. What we don't realize is in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, prophets are put into the context of a fellowship and connection to other. In the Old Testament, you'd see a prophet kind of just wander in alone, speak uh, the word to Israel, and like uh, sometimes they just speak it, and you know, and 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 they'd be there connected to it. Sometimes it's just like they just bring this word, and they're kind of a solo work. In the New Testament, the prophets are connected to the to the others, to the teachers, to the pastors, to the evangelists, to the apostles. Right. Uh, so, so there's when it's taught, it's taught in the sense of accountability, connection. But but we're we're in healthy dependency with each other, and also in the body. No one's like in this high pedestal place of untouchable kind of of posture. So. Let me talk about a prophet, both Old and New Testament. What they do very powerfully is they bring the word of the Lord that takes the past, brings it into perspective, where we are right now, where we are headed. And in the Old Testament, you could read scriptures over and over again. And you could read where a prophet in the Old Testament is speaking about Israel. And we read it and we go, wait, but is that us? Yeah. But is wait, it's Israel? Yes. <laughs> you know? Well, he's speaking, wait, he's speaking about Jesus. Yup. Speaking that too. Wait, he's speaking about the second return, isn't he? Yup. That's why the word of God is so powerful. It's so multifaceted that it can have so many powerful meanings that we um, need to allow ourselves to take in. Prophets have a way of putting things in perspective, reminding you of who you are and bringing timely words for where we're headed right now. We treat prophets as a lot of times we can treat them as like uh, fortune tellers where we want them to tell us our future, right? Because we have this longing, this need to know, this sense of like, you know, I need you to, I need you to tell me, I need you to tell me so that I, 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 I feel better. And, and their job is not to like be fortune tellers, although there is, can be, here's what's coming kind of stuff or here's where we're headed kind of things. But I think many times, Certain preachers can be prophetic, but they're not, they don't call themselves prophets. They, um, and I, I get concerned about people that call themselves prophets. They put it in their title and they carried it around. I just find that can be, I find that that's their brokenness, wanting validation, to be very, very honest. And I think there are people who prophesy powerfully and operate in what I could say they're, they're, they, they have a a prophet working and calling in their life and they don't wear it as a badge. They just kind of do it and they're in the body of Christ and they bring exhortation, edification, comfort. They bring that about. There are many in the body of Christ who they, they, they forget this, this scripture where like, that's the purpose. It's to realign the body of Christ in the good news of the gospel. And it's like, well, it's not just always good news. It, there's there's a thing in the church where 
we we want somebody to we've been trained in a guilt condemnation kind of way like we want somebody to punch us in the face I remember so many times coming out of church, people were like, man, that was really good. You know, somebody, they just knocked me out and punched me and, oh, I feel so strengthened today. And it's like, where's this self-beating coming from? And I think it goes back to our training and like trying to achieve holiness. And we want, we want God to yell at us and it's like, ah, that's good. He really, you know, he's just real mad at us today. And we lose sight of this. And then they will speak to those who say, Hey, we need to edify, exhort and comfort. Like we need to build people up. They're like, well, it's not just Pollyanna. It's not just good. It's it's like, like two sides arguing with each other, but really the, the, the core is this passage of scripture of what prophecy ought to do. It puts things in context for your life. And sometimes there've been people who've been prophetic to you and you didn't even realize it. They helped remind you who you are. Sometimes in a counseling session, I can bring about a, a, a prophetic flow, but I don't call it that. And I'm not like in a, I don't like change the tone of my voice. You know, the Holy Spirit says that today God is speaking. You know, there's, it, 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 it's interesting what we expect things to be. And, and so I, I think that, when you when you look at prophetic words now now we're going to get into to prophetic words i i'm going to get back in here into the question you say i have been greatly blessed by the prophetic but also greatly confused by it because of ocd in my life and black and white thinking and this is important to be aware of when you have these certain battles you uh bipolar even depression there there are things you need to be aware of and how you process and take in and i think there's some healthy patterns we can we can take in mind when understanding uh the 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 prophetic work and and prophetic ministry i've been given quite directional prophetic words which i have not asked for these these are concerns in my life too when there is there can be a lot of directional prophetic words a couple concerns is that uh, we can see prophetic ministry happening, but Paul in his writing, I'll bring us back to scripture here. Let me see if I can find this. If you give me just a second, because this comes to mind. Just let me scroll here for a second. Okay, look, look at this passage of scripture. This is in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak. So Paul's taking this very fiery working of the gifts in, in Corinth. It was just like it was just like all kinds of stuff happening. Great stuff, but also some crazy stuff going on that he had to bring order to. And so he said, all right, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. I think this is a missing component. We, 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 a prophet or, or someone who says they're a prophet or someone with a prophet, prophetic ministry or whatever gives a prophecy and everyone takes the whole thing as like, this is true. We need to follow this. And we don't make room for let the body judge. And this, it, it puts a safety valve around prophetic words. I think what I experience a lot of times a prophetic word happen, people get the recording or they document it, they write it down and they're just following it like a treasure map. And I think what we need to do is, I think pastors, church leaders, uh, mature people, elders, sit back and go, hey, let's weigh this a bit because this judging is not being judgmental. You know, when we think of judge, we think of like the hammer hitting. It's we're weighing this. We're like just pondering this. We're, we're, we're taking this in, in in context. We're not hyperventilating. We're not going to quickly knee jerk reacts. We want to be mature people. Listen, when an angel of the Lord came to Mary, the Bible says she pondered these things in her heart. So it, it is a very mature step for your mental health. When you experience someone giving you a word to let it have context, because people with obsessive compulsive, they can immediately go to, I'm missing God, or I need to do this, I need to follow this. And so um, there is there is a big call, a big call. When you want to operate in the gifts, that, that, that Paul talks about 
in the New Testament. We don't always think about this. Listen to what I'm saying. If you feel like you want to get more involved in the working of the gifts, it will require you to deal with your stuff. You're, you're going to have to deal with your, your mental health, your emotional health. You're going to have to deal with insecurities. I'm going to prove it to you right here because I, I never hear this. I never heard this taught on. It's just, look at the next verse, okay? Let two or three prophets speak and let others judge. How mature does a church need to be to follow this? Let's just be honest. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first one keep silent. So Mr. Mark gets up. <clears throat> I sense the Lord saying that um, I feel that you know God is, and I think that we need to, and and I see in in uh, in Romans chapter, and I start, and that's what I you know saying, and oh wait, you have something? Okay, I'm gonna sit down. Go ahead. <laughs> show me somebody that'd be mature enough to be able to go oh yeah yeah i know i think this guy's got something and i need to step back here we have we all have such insecurities and well you know i have a prophetic ministry and god's called me and i have a word of the lord and there is a massive working of pride amongst this i have a healing ministry and we're exaggerating healing results and i have a sense of what god is doing and you need to listen to me because i'm telling you what's happening and then we see over and over and over again, people prophesying predictive things and they get it wrong and then they ignore it like it didn't happen. And this was a struggle for me because there, there are many times I've seen words given to, uh, to countries or about where God is taking even elections or where, what's going to happen in nations and it doesn't happen. And, and, and it does concern me when there isn't a sense of like, hmm, humility of, hey, I'm still learning, I'm still growing, because we all have to maintain humility in the process in the body of Christ. I'm still learning, I'm still growing, God's still working on my life. Stay humble under the mighty hand of God, because we don't have the monopoly on these things. It, it, uh, it, but it's very challenging to see people who operate in what they say is prophetic, but they're not willing to say, hey, I, we see through a glass dimly. Paul said in his writing in, in, uh, in Corinthians, just a little bit back from where I am now, is we see through a glass dimly right now. So on your best day, on your and Paul's best day, the guy who had third heaven encounters and uh, had uh, some of the most amazing miracles that we, we, we read about and hear about, right? On his best day, he's still seeing through a foggy lens. And so that's, that's to put graciousness on our lives because there can be this lack of, hey, you know, I'm still learning. Now, some would throw stones and go, I'm never going to listen to him again. I'm never going to listen to that person again. Again, in the Old Testament, there was a different context. In the New Testament, the prophet is amongst the body of Christ, okay? Is amongst other leaders that are mentioned, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, right? They all w work together. There's, there's, there's elders, overseers, and then even... Let the body, let others judge. There might be healthy people in the body of Christ that say, you know, here's, here's, here's what I'm sensing. There's a wing. We have to be healthy to operate in that. And this is why there's so much confusion around these subjects, because we're goofy. We're still living in spiritual slavery. We've got daddy issues and mommy issues, and we go into church, and those daddy and mommy issues come out because we're trying to bring a swagger. We're, we're trying to bring, like, I have a supernatural connection with God. I think it, I, I, I get very concerned of the presentation of ministry that communicates, I have a special download from God that you don't have, and you need to come to me because I have something that you don't have. It creates this posture that, to be honest, it was something Martin Luther back in the Reformation broke from, of this sense of like priest laity uh, division of a lay person, unlearned, I know, and you don't. And Martin Luther was like, oh, this is by grace and the priesthood of the believers. We want to equip you. Now, I may be an overseer, but I'm, I'm to be humbled. This is why we don't understand 
subjects like submission and things like that, because we don't understand leaders are first to be submitted to God and they're to walk in that humility. Humility doesn't mean you're a pushover. Humility doesn't mean you beat yourself up. You hate yourself, that false humility stuff, yeah, that, that, that kind of stuff. That's, that, that's not, it's being under the hand of God because we're all learning and we're all growing. There are two prophetic words that were given to me that to this day follow me in my life and my journey and have been eye-opening. Very, very eye-opening. And then I'll give you some that were detrimental to my mental health and spun me out. One was back when I was working at the church I talk about in Connecticut, it was a, an Assemblies of God church, but they didn't, they didn't operate publicly in, in the gifts often. It became kind of a big church and there's a lot of services. So in the, in the assemblies of God, you'll have like a spectrum of where they, believe, you know, they might believe in the gifts, but they may not just practice it a lot. Then there's some that practice it very, very openly and quite often. And in this particular church, they weren't, it wasn't practiced uh, very often at, at all. I would say from, uh, from just watching the services, they, they would probably call themselves, you know, more of a Baptocostal church, I meaning a mixture of like, it could look no different than than, than, a, than, a, than some Baptist churches, not all, but some, right? Just maybe some more, maybe certain music or things that they would, would do differently. The reason I bring that up is there wasn't, there wasn't teaching or really equipping in uh, or, or even real acknowledgement of prophets or prophetic ministry. So at that time in my journey, I'm single, I'm young, and I was, uh, at that time, I was leading, um, I was overseeing the youth ministry, but there was some, something happened where there was a shift and I was beginning to move into music and I was moving into other aspects in, in the church. So that was a, a transition. Later on, we ended up hiring a youth pastor and then I, I kind of moved on into different, different roles. This is all important to lay out because I'm leading worship as church and we have a special guest speaker. And the special guest speaker, uh, he, he traveled with his, him, himself, his wife, and his daughter. And they kind of freaked me out a bit. They had just spoken at a youth camp that I was at where they were giving like prophetic words and speaking over people's lives. And it freaked me out. It, I'll be honest. It was like, this is weird. This is weird. And <laughs> looking back, I, I, I could see I just wasn't used to this. If you're not used to that kind of culture, it, it can frighten you. I've even learned later on in my journey where I, I allowed prophetic ministry to encourage me and I even used it and operated in it to encourage others where I saw at times where like what I was saying was like too much for them. It was like, it was like overwhelm, right? Uh, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not used to that, that kind of thing. But anyways, um, they had this habit where they would, you know, before the message, they may be, yeah, I have, I have somebody I want to pray over. And, and I had this thing of like, I, 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 I cannot let this happen. I do not want them calling me out. So what I did was we had, I think we had about four or five services that weekend. Uh, it was a lot. It's just, you know, there's many of you in ministry, you know what I'm talking about. So I would lead worship and my job was at the end of it to, to hand it off. And, um, I would, I would lead worship, hand the mic off, and I would get out of there as soon as I could. Like I, out the back door, behind the stage, out of there. And so I did this. There was, <laughs> there was this fear, like, uh, you know, they're looking at me. Uh, there's something. Oh, anyways, so one of the services, the daughter goes, um, can you go get that? She was, she was British. So it's like, can you go get that Mr. Mark over there, that Pastor Mark? Bring him over here. And I'm like, oh, this is going to get weird. I'm so nervous. I'm all goofy. I got anxiety issues anyway. And I'm in a suit, you know, one of those like, you know, assemblies of God suits. <laughs> and, and she calls me and she says, I want, you, I want you to stand in front of the stage facing the congregation. And it's like, it's always awesome when people from the UK talk about God because it just sounds like amazing. She gave a word over me that day that at first frightened me, but the more she talked, I began to fall into what Paul said, edification, exhortation, comfort. It was one of the first times somebody spoke into my life 
You see, sometimes we go, hey, that person really spoke into my life. We don't call it prophecy, but they spoke a reminder of who we are and what we're capable of. And, and she did it that day. It reminded me of a time when I was at the front stage in our church culture. We call it the altar. You go to the altar to pray after service. And I remember as a little kid, uh, maybe 15, well, 12, 13, 14 years old, somewhere in there, my youth pastor coming to me, praying for me, and just saying one simple word. You've got, you've got a sensitive heart. It's like he called out, like, like sometimes we don't realize how powerful just a simple word is can be of somebody calling out. And we don't call it prophetic ministry. We like, no, tell me where I'm going. Tell me what's going to happen. So let me go back to where I'm at the stage. She has me stand up in front of the stage. And I, I said this in one of my other videos. So um, forgive me if I'm repeating the story. But she said, I want you to take your jacket off. So I took my suit jacket off. And I'm like, okay, this is going to get, this is going to go from weirder to weirdy McWeird. Take the jacket off. I put the jacket down. And I'm kind of looking at the congregation. They're not used to this either. So they're kind of going, where's this going, right? And then she says, um, I want you to loosen your tie. So I had a shirt and I loosened the tie. And now I'm like, I, like is she going to tell me to take my shirt off? Like, this is, <laughs> like, my mind is racing in this moment. And so I'm standing like, we have like these steps that go down the steps to the, to the congregation, right? So I'm like standing on like, like one of like the step down. And she says, um, she's standing on the side and she's like, she's like kind of pointing this way. She's like, I, I want you to roll up your sleeves. So she had me roll up my sleeves. So my ties loosened, kind of my shirt's open like this. My sleeves are rolled up. And she says to the congregation, I want you to understand that's Mark. And it was a, because it took me a while to understand what she was saying because I was lost in the nervousness of the moment. But what she was saying in that moment was she was saying, I want to remind you that this is, that's who he really is. Beware of putting a form on him. It was like, beware of putting Saul's armor on David. I'm not trying to say I'm David. I'm just using the analogy, okay? Um, and, and I think that that's been such a journey in my life because I have fulfilled pastoral roles in the institutional church model, but there's so much about it that it's not me. It's not me. I've done it. I've done it in larger settings, smaller settings, some in between, but there was aspects of it wasn't me. Still, still a sense of calling to teach, to, to, but there was like a mixture of who I am that I've had to figure out over the years and come to learn who I am. And this word that she gave me reminded me because then she set me, she set me on the floor and she had all the teenagers and the young people, because at the time I was in my 20s, had all the people younger than me stand behind me and she formed an arrow. So it'd be me. And then she had people like lying this way, this way, like this way, almost like a, like a, like a shape of an arrow. And she told the congregation, you'd understand that he's going to, he's going to take and lead. He, he's going to take and lead. Sorry. My, uh, my headphone just got unplugged. He's going to take and lead the younger generation into places that at first you may not understand what he's trying to do, but he's, there's this work of God that is on his life. And the congregation was very supportive. Like, yeah, yeah, this is great and stuff like that. But it took actually years for me to recall that and to realize what it did to remind me of who I was, recalibrate me and to encourage something in my life to see it. And to call it out. And I think that there's an importance in the body of Christ. If you want to really change someone's life, help them understand who they are. I can change someone's behavior so much quicker by just reminding them of who they are. That you're sons and daughters of God. That there's a special work on our life. We like to jump to like the, we want to jump into correction. I think the church can be obsessive compulsive about correcting people. We feel like we're the Holy Spirit. We jump in. We want to get in people's, uh, uh, you know, stuff, and 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 we want to jump right in there. I'm not saying that that should never happen, but I'm saying it takes a lot of relational work to bring those kind of a uh, kind of words. That word has had a very special place in my heart. Maybe someday I'll bump into her. I don't, I don't even remember what she looked like. You know, it's, it's it was it was we're talking, you know, twenty. 
20 something plus years ago. I, um, but I'd, I'd like to thank her, but there's a second one, very meaningful to my life and my journey. This person was not a well-known prophet, uh, does not have a branded ministry out there, popular. Everyone can, you know, search and follow on social media. In fact, he was pretty, pretty quiet behind the scenes kind of guy, but he, he was one of those like kind of old school preachers, you know, like to get up there and they kind of scream and holler and, and, and fire you up. And, but he had a good heart. He had a good heart and I could appreciate that in him. And on one day I was speaking at this church and I, there was barely anyone there. And I was just trying to teach the heart of the father and, 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 and speak our need for, for, for heart healing in our lives. And, and I, I developed a little bit of a relationship with him, a little bit of a rapport. And he uh, walked out and he said, you know, I just, I just feel like I just want to pray for you for a minute. And he said this to me and it just, it hit me. He said, he just, it was real simple. He said, I feel the Lord saying to you, God's going to show his faithfulness in your life, that he is faithful. He is faithful with where you, with where you are, and he's gonna, you're going to see his faithfulness along your journey. And at the time, I was in a season of just really battling depression, depression that got inflamed over big changes I had made. I'd left a church. I'd started a new ministry. I got newly married. I was exhausted at the change and the transition. And then I, I bumped into very well-known at least in the area, uh, prophets that had you know prophetic ministry, and they spoke, they spoke some very long words, very specific words. There were some great things in it, but there were some very time sensitive material in it. In this year, two thousand six, in two thousand seven, in two thousand eight, this is what's going to happen. You're going to travel to these cities, to these places. You're going to go here, and this is what's going to happen, right? And I spiraled. I'm, I must have missed God because those things didn't happen. They didn't happen. And I'm even trying to contact either them or somebody like, help me make sense of this. I, I've got these. I want to believe in this. They're very, very specific in timing. It didn't happen. So what do I do? And people are like, well, maybe the date is off, but the word is there. Like, okay, this is getting all really confusing because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm day to day trying to connect with God. I have, there's, there's a message of healing that I feel strongly about, but I'm really battling. I, I, I'm trying to figure out financial provision. I'm struggling every day. And I notice in the body of Christ, there's a lot of believers suffering with depression because they feel they miss God off of a prophetic word they were given. Because there is a undercurrent that is, often taught, you get a prophetic word, it's your responsibility to steward it and to process it. And I get what they're saying. We're participating with the word of the Lord in our lives, but we're also putting this yoke of burden on people and they're, and, and, and we're tagging into their performance mode, their performance driven behavior, their, you know, and we're putting this perfectionistic stuff on them. And I'm sitting here going, what do I do? Cause I think I'm, I might've missed God. And I didn't, I was right where I needed to be. And really what I needed to do was, was <laughs> the word of the Lord for me is just Mark one step in front of the other. This is hard, but just keep doing what you're doing. And that is, um, in addition to those first two stories I shared with you, that man talking about the faithfulness of God. There's been numerous times where I've had these interactions with people. Some of it was just a business thing. Some of it might be uh, interacting with somebody in a, in a store or, or just everyday conversation. And I'd walk away with this resonating thought of just keep doing what you're doing. One step in front of the other. In fact, for many of you in your journey, where you're headed, you're, 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 you're wanting to heal. You're wanting to experience freedom. You're pursuing, connecting to God's love. You're trying to figure out your journey. A lot of times the word is just keep doing what you're doing. One foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. I'm super concerned that in our desire to operate in gifts, that we don't take into perspective what it's, what it's landing into. I'm concerned that many times prophetic words can fall into the context of manic behavior. So, for example, when we talk about mania, mania is typically brought about in the context of bipolar, which is a mood disorder. 
and there's there's variations of of what that looks like but having manic highs and very deep lows depressive lows they used to, used to call it manic depression and it changed to bipolar uh, in the terminology and it's this it's a it's a mood disorder pattern and this is this is um this is kind of hidden underneath the surface a lot of times in the body of Christ. We don't recognize this pattern. And many times our prophetic culture can feed manic behavior. No one's talking about this. So I, I might as well just, you know, hit the record button and let her rip. We're not talking about this, that we, that we can be very manic. And here's what I mean by very manic. That in our messages, you're all going to the nations. You're all going to be this. It's like every word given to everyone is big, huge. You're going to, the resources and gold and finances, and you're going to go to the nations. And it, it can be encouraging manic behavior that it's got to be up here, up here, up here all the time. And this place, and we're going, and we're killing it, and we're killing And it is fueling addict behavior. I got to have this high in my life with God and it's got to be big. It's not big enough. So sometimes our vision of what God is doing combines in with concepts of American performance or American achievement or uh, whatever country nation you're in of that building big and it has to be bigger and bigger and bigger that we oftentimes merge it. So it's not fancy if a prophet says to you or a believer prophesies to you and says, it's amazing what you're doing as a mother and a father right now, that doesn't bring clicks. It, it's not fancy. It doesn't attract the applause and oohs and ahs. So we don't see the beauty in the small significant moments. And we don't see the beauty in, in just a, 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 a simple guy or simple lady, just everyday believers being used in profound ways, but because it doesn't make headlines and it's not big numbers and big things and you're you know, famous. Beware of the pull to be famous. Beware of the pull because many times the prophetic word meets a broken heart and pulls on those rejection wounds and father wounds and now we step out to follow this prophetic word and we are immersing our identity into it we're lost in it i also saw you know behind the scenes a lot of concerns of people that you know jump into you know, the uh, ministry even ministry and just in general but even pr pr prophetic supernatural kind of ministry and they're not dealing with their father wounds they're not dealing with the the aspects of of brokenness in their life. I get very concerned about that that orphan spirit carrying into the things that we're doing, and and not recognizing. I mean, we all have them. We all have them. Going back to those words that were, I was struggling with depression. What I needed was this. Going to take longer <laughs> than you think it's going to take. You're right where you need to be, one step in front of the other. This isn't going to be forever. Because it was, it felt like hell. And then I had these prophetic words in accusing me. I wasn't sensing edification, exhortation, and comfort at all. And so um, I found, are we fueling, are we fueling people where everyone in the church, you're going to be going to this nation, you're going to be going to that nation. And we don't see the significance of, hey, building your marriage God's working on that. And it's like, that's not snazzy. I'm grateful looking back because 2006, 2007, 2008 were prophesied as they were going to be the greatest years of my life of increase. And they were, they were, I would actually put them and stack them as the most challenging, most difficult, most painful years of my life. I'm glad that I didn't have those things open up and me traveling and doing all those things. I'm glad. I'm actually grateful now as I've allowed myself to heal. And it's like, oh, it's not about that. I'm learning in the journey. And I, 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 I'm not going to hate those prophecies, but I'm also not going to, you know, treat them right in line with, with, with the written word of God. You know, they, they, they need context. They need, they need assessment, judging, and so forth. But I'm grateful because during those years where we had Max and, and then later Abby and 
that I've, I've been able to have the years of having a bond with my children to develop the bond there. If I got, if I got lost in flying here and going there, I wouldn't have developed the bond I have with my children right now. And in fact, a lot of our ministry models encourage, you know, dads, especially dads being away a lot when their children are very young. And that's the season where you bond. That's where you bond with your children. And in their teenage years, you work off of the bond you built in their younger years as you're nurturing them at different stages in their life, right? And so we're still breaking out of this pattern where we got to go for that ministry thing. We got to go do... and. I looked in my journey where it was like for a while, no, nah, you don't have to go. The, you don't have, nope. I felt this thing to like be like everyone else because they would speak this and you're going to go here and you're going to go there. And maybe you should speak at this place, Mark. Your message needs to be that big place, right? And I'm grateful. It may sound strange to somebody. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a gratitude I have that it didn't happen that way. I'm grateful I have a real connection to my kids. And then over the years, um, being able to discover who I really am. And I enjoy what I'm doing now. I had a dream a long time ago about putting stuff in video content that would be things that would be kind of part of an archive where people could search. It's not just a one-time thing, something they could go back to even years later and access, and it could be a blessing to their life and their journey. And we live in that, in that culture now with the accessibility of video content, searching and online, and, and to be able to do one-on-ones and be able to, to share and, and put teachings together and write books, right? It's been this long journey of me discovering that, and it was through practice, just practicing. I didn't, I didn't one day go, God's called me to do this, 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 and this. It was just more like, I don't know. I feel like maybe I should write this. Maybe it should be a book. Did you see? And, and, and in the midst of it, God's working. I'm just learning and growing and I'm sharing with others what he's showing me in my life and my journey. And to, to be able to be where I am now. And I, I look at the future and I go, well, there's a, there's a couple of different directions this could go. There's a bunch of different directions that this could take. My passion example for mental health, who knows where it can go? I don't want to put any limitation on that. But yet my daily work is not being obsessed about some big vision that I got to like, I'm going to stress myself out and lose connection with my family. God's grace knows where we're at in our journey. My kids need their father around. My wife and I, uh, I, I, I treasure my marriage so much. Now, there's times and seasons where that may shift as my kids get older and things and things happen, right? But I think a lot of the words that people get, we 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 have to be aware of when we're prophesying over people. Are we valuing just simple everyday things? You know, we feel we have this need out of out of brokenness. The brokenness really just like takes over of this need to feel significant. Now, that's a, that's a legitimate need. I feel like I belong, that my life has meaning. That's legitimate. When brokenness takes it over, it's got to be so amazing. We can't appreciate. You can't appreciate just in every, like you have a conversation with someone at CVS and you have a nice interaction with them and you, you say something kind and encouraging to them. Like that's, that's not a big deal. I would say, I disagree. I disagree. I think that when I, when I saw the pattern, because there are a number of people I've worked with in one-on-one settings that they are, they're struggling because they think because they're not at that level that they've done something wrong. I've had people, they've gotten words, it hasn't happened, and they're struggling with depression. Some go into depression and then go into OCD over it. The, the depression fuels the OCD, and now they're obsessive compulsive about trying to figure out their life and their journey, and they haven't grieved right? There's parts of that season I needed to grieve. It was painful. It was hard. It's actually humbled me and given me a lot of compassion for people. It kind of burned out some of that stuff in me that like, you know, that perfectionistic or that like, I got everything right or, or I know what people need and, and all that kind of stuff that just needed like burning out and burning out and burning out. Those wilderness kind of experiences or those valleys, they humble us. And bring us to places that can really form beautiful things if we allow it. But I, man, I had that depression firing at me. 
until that day where I was like, no, God's going to show his faithfulness in me. And this is about his work, his handiwork and all of this. He's going to take this and he's going to work it together for good. And I don't know what it's like yet. It's, it's, it's not, but it's not over. And God is redemptive. And I had to take the self-pressure off. And I also saw, sometimes we look to the prophets, right? And, and I, I also notice people using, my wife calls it the prophetic deli counter, where like people, when they're struggling, instead of dealing with their issues, they go to a prophet, give a word to, 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 to comfort me, to let me know I'm going to get out of this. And we get addicted, you know, to going to the prophets. We get addicted to like, I, 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 need, I, need, I need to get a word to get me out of this. And I would find, no, I, I think you just need to grieve through some of these emotions. You're blaming yourself for what's going on. You're trying to get a prophetic word to like, hope it'll make you feel better to get out. But how about just grieve what you've been through? Just pause, just say la for a bit, slow down, right? I also noticed too, a lot of people were chasing ministry as a way of dealing with their brokenness. Their marriages were a mess. Their, their, um, their mental health was a mess. I'm not saying this uh, accusatory. I'm just pointing out they, they were suppressing, dressing that to go chase their ministry. So they would, I, I saw countless going out, uh, just ministering, uh, prayer ministry, this, this, everywhere they could. And the churches kind of go, thank you, thank you, that's amazing. We love that. But it's like, wait a second. So my wife and I had a, had a bit of a different approach. Like, hey, you know, that's awesome. Your ministry and all this stuff and prayer. So how are things with you and your, your, your spouse? How are things with your kids? It's not an accusatory question. It's not an interrogation. It's let's redirect to the core things. And what I found is that the marriage was difficult. So instead of dealing with it, I'll just go out and do ministry. The stuff with kids is 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 difficult so i'll just go out and do ministry it became a replacement to not deal with stuff and we as the body of christ we need to be more equipped to like deal with this stuff it's not shame it's not oh your marriage is messed up so it's shame on you no, 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 no there's a lot of people in ministry having really difficult stuff in their marriages or in their parenting what they need is they need support they need to have pressure taken off so as pastors many pastors need to take sabbaticals they need to take breaks they need to bring the rpms down because they're in significant seasons need to pay attention to uh, many times in ministry you know, like a, like a pastor will go, oh, my wife and I are having trouble. And he can see like his wife's struggle, it's weighing him down. And he needs a perspective change. This isn't weighing you down. This is the ministry. It's just this big thing takes over because modern ministry becomes a corporate machine that will own you. It will own you and take over your life. And now you don't have time to deal with yourself, to deal with your life. So I think that there's a, there's a priority shift. And I think when it comes to prophetic ministry, I would say a lot of things are said are actually prophetic. But they don't even understand they're prophetic. And, and certainly we have our share of where it's not prophetic, it's pathetic. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Um, but I think that, I think that prophecy needs to be in context with the body of Christ. That's why we need each other and we ponder and we share and under the counsel that we 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 learn to to grow in things. Because my going back to this this question here, there I went on a went on an hour of talking, you know, before I even get to the meat of your question. So you say you've been given quite directional prophetic words, which I've not asked for. That's understandable shared by people I know who have told me they have been praying for me and are passing on what they are sensing. Also, I've been picked out and prophesied over by leaders of meetings. I've been attending so others have heard what has been shared and said how much they agreed with what was shared, even though I felt a bit unsure when I heard it. Yeah, and, and for me, if I was giving you feedback and I said, yeah, I, 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 you know what that word was? I agree with what it was saying to you. And you're like, I don't get it, that my response to that would be, okay, just think about it, but not under pressure, not under duress. It's not like, oh, you're missing God if you don't get it, right? God knows how to work in our lives and our journey. So um, I would not be promoting, oh, you need to hurry up and get this 
because my own connection with the Lord at times is not that strong. I was diagnosed with a type of bipolar where I go through short seasons of being very zealous in my faith, feeling incredibly connected with God, then long seasons of feeling totally disconnected with God. I would feel, see, this, this, this is what needs shepherding of people being aware that this is a pattern in your life. Because if, if uh, having this in mind, I would feel protective as your pastor of words being given to you. I want to be aware of where you're at in your journey. Because it's very, very challenging when someone has bipolar tendon, uh, has bipolar patterns in their life and they're in them and they don't realize it. For certain people, it can take over so much. They're not aware, like, oh, I'm, I'm in a very heightened state. Because in that heightened state, addictions come in. Uh, very high risk behaviors can come into play, right? And we... <laughs> I've seen some of these manic moments happen during church services, you know, where it's like, wait, 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 this dude's having, he's in a, he's in a, he's in a, he's in a manic ramp up. And it's like, oh, praise the Lord. Like, oh, God, thank you for your patience. Cause we're just, you know, um, I, I, I have concerns that even we have to be aware of schizophrenia in the sense of certain, you know, people who prophesy that have battles with schizophrenia. Um, schizophrenia is is a mental health condition where there's certain certain realities you're hearing, right? Certain things that you're hearing. It can almost be like you're getting voices. It's it's not multiple personalities. People talk about schizophrenia as though it's like multiple personalities. It's it's more of like a like a like a, a prompting. A, a reality of thought that you're listening to, that you're hearing, that you feel is a reality, and you live out of that. That's why it's called paranoia. Uh, uh, paranoia. There's paranoia, paranoid schizophrenia. There's a paranoia mixed in too. You, there's a reality you believe, and it makes you paranoid. Uh, there's an aspect of paranoid schizophrenia that Saul in the Old Testament had, and uh, you can you can see you know uh, how that fear and his insecurity. And, and that stuff rose up, and he didn't deal with it. He fed it, and then it made him so paranoid. He's losing his mind, and then he's going to, you know, get advice from, from a witch and things like that. You just, he, he's, he's, he's losing his sanity, and he's tormented, right? Um, I say all that to say that this is why it's important we build relationships that we know, and we give opportunity to to, to speak into each other's lives where we, we, we're, we're loving each other, but we're also sharpening each other and we're, and we're aware. In your case, in, with bipolar, I would be very um, guarded as, as, as a pastor. And I think I, I give a lot of credit to pastors that the shepherding that they have to do. Because sometimes people are like, I have a prophetic ministry. They come in, they bark a bunch of words, and then they're out the door. These things need shepherding. I started to like, and when I would speak at churches, I would start to say, the things I'm going to say here, am I aware that these things I'm going to say need to be shepherded, right? Because sometimes people can come in and say something and they can hit people hard or whatever and just walk out and not have to deal with the, um, the collateral effects of it. So, so you have, I think, so bipolar, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's showing your healing journey of grounding your mood. And we want to pray for God to bring healing to how your mood goes so that you become regulated. So you can have good moments, appreciate them. And, but when you're depressed, you can keep that in mind that when you're, when you're depressed, you, you, you have a, an awareness. Oh, this is what's kicking up. It's this low depression part. So I don't, I don't want to feed this disempowered mindset that's coming into me right now. During seasons where I've gone through more depression kind of battles, I've had a, um, a, a, a guiding mindset of, I don't want to feed this or make big decisions based just on this, what this is saying right now. I want to be tender to it. I want to be gracious, let love bring some rebalancing right back. But if you're also going into manic patterns, you need to realize in some of those heightened states to bring self-awareness. And that's sometimes the challenging part is the awareness of that. You can get lost in it so much, right? What's the healing journey? Rooted and grounded in love. 
Paul's that you you would know the love of Christ, that you would know God's heart for you, that you would let that love get rooted and established. Because people with mood disorders, um, there can be a lot of different influences, but spiritually and emotionally, there can be a healing of nurture in your life. Nurture is the emotional calibration that allows us to we can we can be down and it's okay, and then we begin to slowly come back up and we have a baseline that we're meeting at each day. And then we have those moments we can celebrate, rejoice, and wow, it's wonderful, and, and have laughter and, and joyous expression. And then there's a baseline, the baseline being peace. I'm rooted and grounded in his love for me. It takes work. It takes learning. So with that in mind, I would be cautious about throwing prophetic words at you and uh, because it can add confusion. Now, in Paul's writing, in, in, um, in the same section here that I was reading on 1 Corinthians 14, God, um, he talks about you, um, for all, for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and be encouraged. So this is really like dispersing out the work of, of prophecy, not just like, oh, I'm the prophet. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And the body of Christ needs to constantly be recalibrated into peace. You are the beloved. You are his. You are loved. God is with us. He is with you. You are his daughter. You are his son. You are a child of God. Like We need to constantly be recalibrated in that. You're set apart. You're not of this world. We see the scriptures sometimes in our mental health battles as accusing us when they're supposed to be reaffirming and reminding you of who you are. Are you getting encouraged? Because I am. God's not the author of So when you see confusion in the midst, okay, God's not trying to make me confused. God is not, it, like, for example, God's will. Oh, uh, what is it? If I go left and I go right somewhere, like we got a treasure map out and I got to go and take a left over. At, it, it, mm -mm. He's not the author of confusion. But peace. Be still. Don't fuss. God's not giving us fear. So that's not of me. God's not giving you confusion. That's not of him. God's not, giving, not, God's not condemning you. There's no condemnation to us. That's not God's operating mechanism for us. So that guilt, shame stuff, no. You miss God, you blew it. Yeah, you can make mistakes, make 40, mis 40 mistakes, 50 mistakes, and God's still here right now to do a new work. To do a new work. Oh, I miss God. I thought I missed God. And then one day I was like, eh, maybe those, those prophet people missed it. Now, am I going to call them false prophets? I don't know necessarily. I just think they missed it and maybe could have just said, you know, don't always get it right. And, and some people have a problem with that. They, they, it's like, no, they can't handle that kind of messy growth in the church. Right. And, and I, if you're in that, I get it. It's, it's, I got no arguments with you. I mean, you're like, I don't, but I've benefited from certain unctions of words spoken to me that I needed to hear. And there are times where just that encouragement really helped save my sanity to remind me God's peaceable and he's wanting to bring you back into peace. So you, you say here, um, I recently moved back to my home nation feeling during one of my good periods of move that God was confirming I was to move. Now I wouldn't, when we look at moving, you know, I've, I've, I've moved. I recently, you know, f almost four years ago, re completely relocated. And, and who knows what, what steps will, will, will be next, right? But we can put a lot of added pressure on this and uh, on moving or relocating or where to go. And I like to take that pressure off and look at this as discovery. Just one day at a time, I'm just kind of seeing. And maybe you think of moving and you look at a place and you're going to look at, you You know, I think, I'm wondering if maybe that's a place where I'd like to live. And you, you, you just let God work, but in the simplicity of, I'm going to figure it all out. <laughs> not, not having that kind of pressure. I've received, um, okay. However, all the feelings I had previously being out of God's will, despite being absent when I came home initially, are all coming back. I've received prophetic words, direction confirming my move, and other input that I need to return to where I, I previously lived. Now, um, if I was sitting down with you, you could have all these prophetic words, you're to move. 
what it, what is what is your sense of of where you are right now? Because I want to encourage your confidence. We can give you all kinds of words and stuff like that. And uh, Christians are obsessed with confirmation. I need confirmation. And we can we can whittle down confirmation to like, oh, I saw a bird, and the bird is this kind of bird, and it means this, and that's confirming that God's meaning this. And it's like, okay, I get you, but we could we could be promoting mental health issues if we keep just digging in that kind of way of constant confirmation and everything is a sign and I'm looking for anything because with obsessive compulsive, they can see meaning in everything in ways that pulls them down. Oh, this happened. Oh, that I see on the news. This, oh, so that means if I do this, we create a lot of distortions. So um, you say, I've not asked for any of this prophetic input. <laughs> Parts of me never wants to receive a prophetic word ever again, as been given by people I know who feel to share things with me. I feel so confused. Okay. God's not wanting you to be confused. He's not trying to confuse you. And would really appreciate having some insight how to navigate the prophetic, knowing God's will, then feeling totally disconnected with God. So we need to work on the disconnection that you that you struggle with with God. Uh, I, I encourage my material reject, exposing the rejection mindset because that's, that's a primary area that fuels our sense of separation and and experiencing God's love as your father. Those I highly highly recommend that because what I would focus in on is you, you don't need to get like a bunch of prophetic words now. I've had to tell people in my work just chill with the prophetic words and just let God work in his word that is in front of you the word of God the scriptures and, and where you sense he's, he's working and operating and take one step at a time because we're allowing him to do a healing work in your mental health. And there are times where either know, you know, many times unknowingly, we are contributing to the erosion of someone's mental health by how we're coming across. And so if people say, I'm praying over you and I got, you can kind of go, I, I, yeah, I appreciate that and put that in context, you know? And um, people will do that to me. Oh, I sense this. Or they'll write to me. I sense this. And it's like, okay, that's nice. But I also need to have, that's where we develop. We, I have to learn to develop my own confidence in my walk. God has to show me that, right? Because people have told me, I, God, I feel God wants you to consider relocating to where we live. I have asked my wife, you know, place after place, you know, I'd go to a church and they're like, you need to come here. You need to move here. Everyone's telling me to move where they are. And if all of them are hearing from God, then I, right now I need to be living in 25 different places at once. <laughs> and it's like, well, you and God needs to speak that, you know, to me <laughs> and, and, and in my life, in my journey, I need to see that. So I would spend more time just on what do you sense? Where are you at? And helping to navigate. You said, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Of course. And I feel the same way too, where there's been, uh, even just, uh, even just recently, I have it over here. There was a, um, I was at a, a conference speaking and someone came up to me and gave me a little picture that they drew of a microphone. And it was a real blessing because at that time I was, I was sensing to get off of all social media I just say like, God told me, I just kind of sense like, I feel like I'm wasting my energy right now in all these social media avenues, but I feel like I really need to invest in YouTube and in those places of video content. And so somebody had a, a booth next to me uh, where I had like a table with my books and stuff. And I, I was speaking there. And just before I left, she said, I just feel to submit this to you. I just sense that this, the sense of like your microphone and God using your microphone and something to the effect of like, just double down on YouTube. And I was like, wow, that's, that's encouraging, you know, and that brought out the exhortation, edification, and comfort to me. I'd already been walking in something, and sometimes what we need is just encouragement. Just keep going where you're going. It, 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 I, 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 as a takeaway, folks, let's appreciate sometimes the simple encouragements people bring. Versus it needing to be this deep thing that's telling me the the, the future and and. You know, let's appreciate sometimes where prophetic can be a simple thing. I've listened to your video, Is This God's Voice, Me, or Mental Illness, which has been helpful. All your material has been incredibly helpful. Just wondering if you had any further insight. So I would recommend 
for anyone, if you're getting anything out of this this video, go to marktasius.com, go to the topics page, and there there's a link that says mental health. And on that, there's a there's even a whole podcast series my wife and I did on mental health, and I talked about reading the Bible uh, for mental health. I, 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 I think it's incredibly, incredibly important in this process, in this journey. So there's some of my feedback about prophetic ministry. I think we could use some grounding. I think we could use some healthier patterns. I in no way want to stand as, I'm not one of those guys that's going to stand there as like some critic and just sit there and be critical. I want to talk about things in love, in grace, and and in recognition that we're all a bit goofy and we all have some we all have some things that can be ironed out, sharpened out in our process and journey. I'm glad God's gracious with us in that and we're learning because in his love I'm changed the most. In his grace is where I'm transformed and set free. So I pray this is a blessing to your life and your journey. If it is, let me know and consider supporting. You can support, of course, with your prayers. If you'd like to donate, you can do a one-time donation at markedasus.com. Click on the donate button or become a regular supporter of the ministry work. But Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, I'll come back with some more stuff in due time. In the meantime, your brother's out. See y'all.